Welcome, everybody. This is Mark Steiner. Good to have you with us here on The Mark Steiner Show on The Real News Network. And last week, you remember, we were talking with Bill Fletcher, Jr. Uh, about the history of our country, race and class, the struggles that happened in the centuries before this, and how it leads today. What did we learn from that? People are always talking about learning from history. The question is, what does it mean to learn from history in terms of planning what we're facing today? And what are we facing today? There's a huge battle over that in our country right now between people who oppose the Trump administration, from liberals to progressives to people on the left, and especially around issues of race, how folks who are leadership in the black community feel about it, in the Latino communities, and more. And so what does all that mean about a strategy to look at where we go from here? You know, Blue Fletcher Jr., as I told you last week, uh, is a longtime trade union activist, the AFL-CIO and the SEIU. He's a noted author. Uh, and has been fighting around issues of racism and class and social justice in this country for a long time. Most recently was president of Trans Africa, the Trans Africa Forum, excuse me, and is once again in our studios here at the Real News Network. Bill, good to see you. Absolutely, I'm glad to do so, this. It's great, always good to talk with you. So, so let's pick up here. I sure. mean, I, I, as someone who loves history as much as you and to understand who we are and where we come from, mm -hmm. The question is, what does it tell us? I really want to figure out what that means in terms of how you think about building something in today's world. Okay. So let me talk with a, a, a start with something that I think a lot of people wrestle with and don't really understand the, the distinctions and the nuance and what they means, what means for our society. This whole battle but now where we see Donald Trump um, imposing tariffs. Mm -hmm. And the response to the European Union, the response now in the People's Republic of China, mm -hmm. um, the battles taking place around that, workers in America saying, yes, we have to have tariffs to get our jobs back, but it doesn't really mean jobs are back. And America and the world has always been involved in battling around the issues of free trade uh, and fair trade and tariffs. Yeah. And what do these words mean? And what, okay. and what does this, to me, and maybe you'll correct some of this, is almost an internal international struggle among capitalist nations and, and businesses that fight around these trade issues. So what do they really mean? I mean, what are we really fighting over here? Okay, so we're trying to divide that into a couple of different parts. Sure. So one is just factually, when, when people talk about tariffs, it basically means taxes. A lot of folks don't realize that. It. It's taxes on, on items uh, that come from another country. So. There's the historical question, and then there's the contemporary question. Let's start historically. Um, there's no developed economy, none, that haven't at some point imposed tariffs and used protectionism. None. Um, and as I mentioned the last time, we fought a civil war that involved slavery and issues of tariffs. That's why I'm raising the issue here now first. Right. Exactly. Right. So why tariffs? Well, it, it's actually a very simple question. Um, economies are always uneven. If you have a country that wants to develop its manufacturing sector, they are competing against companies that are in countries that are inevitably going to be more developed. So let's just use the United States again. So in the 1800s, the United States in the North is trying to develop a manufacturing sector, particularly around cotton and the production of garments. The, um, the British were way ahead of the United States, and they could produce better quality and cheaper items than the northern states of the United States. The southern plantation owners wanted to sell their cotton to the British in, and, and to get cheaper items from Britain. Which is a point of digression. Mm -hmm. It was what helped build capitalism in the first place. There would have been Precisely. no modern capitalism without slavery, cotton, sugar, tobacco, oh, and sending it to Europe and Precisely. building industries in Europe. There Precisely. Would have been no There's a great book about it called The Empire of Cotton that I strongly recommend everyone read. But the other part of it, of course, to digress even more. Sorry, but I no, no, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, the original invasion of the Western Hemisphere and the gold and silver that was plundered and was sent to Europe that to really ignite uh, uh, capitalism. But anyway, going back to the issue of free trade and tariffs. So northern industrial capitalism said, if we permit the southern plantation owners 
to, excuse me, to sell and uh, to their cotton to uh, Britain and to buy cheap items from Britain, we will never get off the ground. And they insisted on a tariff. Well, the southern plantation owners said, no, this is unfair. We want to buy cheaply. So this is where the question for, uh, of, of every country emerges about do you want to have your own manufacturing sector? Because if you don't, then that means you're dependent on someone else. And this clash, Mark, is a clash that has taken place in every developing economy, um, every, everyone, and in, including Britain, ironically, because when Britain was first getting started, they were competing against textiles and garments coming from India, which produce superior items. But in order to develop their own manufacturing sector, they imposed tariffs, right? But when they're up on top, that's when and all eventually of took India over. They took India <laughs> over, right? And, and, and when these countries get on top, that's when they start preaching free trade because it's to their advantage. Now that they have fully developed sectors, they, do, they want to penetrate the economies. Um, there was a major war fought in South America in the 1800s that was a version of our own civil war, and it revolved around this question. And in that setting, the North lost. The, the forces that represented industrial capitalism, they lost. And the British were very involved in that war, um, much as they wanted to be in our war. The British wanted to intervene on the side of the Confederacy. Right. Um, and they were blocked, in part by British workers, interestingly. Uh, the, now, if we go to the present, here's where there becomes a, a very interesting difference. The, the, today's economy is much more linked across national boundaries than it was in the 1800s. You have the, these multinational corporations. Uh, you have the, uh, the fossil fuel industry that, is, uh, that, that uh, exists across national borders. I remember this, this uh, film back in the 80s uh, called The Formula. Marlon, one of Marlon Brando's last films. And there's this guy that's talking about, and uh, Marlon Brando is the, is the CEO of some oil company. And there's this guy talking about the Arabs, the Arabs, the Arabs. And Marlon Brando says, we are the Arabs. Right? <laughs> and, and that's the thing to keep in mind, that these multinational corporations, they may have a headquarters in a particular country, but they are penetrating these different economies. 40% of global trade is intra-corporation trade. Right, so this is like a remarkable 40 development. Forty percent of global trade is, is intra, 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 intra right. corporate. Mm -hmm. So, so, so you have. So when Trump starts talking about tariffs, here's here's my concern. The the loss of manufacturing jobs um, in the United States is primarily the result of the changes in the way that global capitalism operates. So what's been happening over the last 40 or so years is that, 40, 50 years, is that these multinational or transnational corporations have been seeking cheaper labor. They did that first within the United States. They moved from the Northeast into the South and into the Southwest seeking cheaper labor, non-union labor. Um, that was particularly in the textile and garment sector. But then the, th those sectors started moving outside of the United States, seeking even cheaper labor. These same corporations, they weren't going, the, the, the jobs weren't going to Dominican companies or Mexican companies. They're going, U.S. companies were moving. But in the United States, the other thing that was happening was that we started to see changes in technology. So many U.S. companies had not been keeping up with technology. They then started facing competition from companies overseas that had been moving technology, Japanese companies, Germans, Swedes. And, and then what did they do? The steel industry, auto industry, they don't necessarily move overseas, Mark. 
they frequently moved to other parts of the United States, or they changed their technology. They might have downsized. The steel industry did this. They downsized. They moved to rural areas using new technology. So you end up having a situation where it's not necessarily you're competing against foreign workers. It's all of a sudden the, the jobs that were in Youngstown, Ohio, are now in rural Wisconsin. All right, so you have that. But then you have also the introduction of these free trade agreements, uh, NAFTA being a great example of one. So you have the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Now, one of the problems in Trump's narrative is he makes it appear that the U.S. is the victim of the, all of these free trade agreements. Well, what did NAFTA do? NAFTA reshuffled the deck so Canada was losing jobs to the United States. Mexico, the, the Mexican agriculture was devastated by NAFTA. What was the impact of that? Well, when the devastation happens, the Mexican peasants move into the urban areas of Mexico. And then to the United and States. And then to the United States, right? right? And, and they start losing uh, public sector jobs. So instead of this idea, this narrative that the U.S. is the victim, the workers in Canada the United States and Mexico were the victims of these transnational companies. That's not the narrative that Trump was articulating. So let, let, all right. this is a really important segue here, I think, because I'm asking this question as somebody who's been an analyst, this, analyst of this for years, been writing about it, but also as a person who's been an organizer and who's been in unions. And, and, um, and so I ask it in, the, in that context. So. I've not seen an effective response mm -hmm. from progressive forces, from left forces, from unions, from any groups in America that counteract this argument. Clearly, the Democrats who are in leadership in Congress are not going to counter the argument right. to really explain what this question of tariffs, free trade, and fair trade mean in the world and how that affects us as human beings and as society. Uh, but I haven't seen anyone really do it. I mean, and this to me, in some ways, is the core of it. How do you begin to organize around this? And what are we, and, and what are we saying? We can't kind of have, for want of a better term, pedantic intellectual arguments That's right. to, to talk to people about what this is. We've got to get to the heart of it somehow. Right. So that does, yeah, um, I think that's a $64,000 question. Um, so one thing we can't do, we're not going to be able to compete based on wage rates. I, I had this discussion with this um, businessman, <clears throat> actually from Baltimore, I was on a plane. And he was complaining about tax rates and regulations in Maryland and that he was going to uh, open up a company in, in the South or something like that. And, and I realized in talking with him, Mark, that we, there was no common ground between us because I'm looking at it from the standpoint of workers. He's looking at the standpoint of capital. And, and, and so he's saying he wants cheaper labor. Now, what he wants is Governor Hogan, or whoever succeeds Governor Hogan, hopefully, to reduce uh, regulations, to reduce tax rates, to reduce wage rates. The problem is we can't compete that way. It, th that's when people talk about a race to the bottom. You can't compete that way. What we have to do is we have to have a movement that makes sure that when there are trade agreements, that there are real protections <clears throat> on workers and their ability and right to organize, that there have to be protections for farmers, that there have to be environmental guarantees, but that also those of us in the so-called developed world in the global north have to um, build alliances with workers and farmers in the global south and support their efforts to organize. This was part of the mistake that the trade union movement in the United States made when industries were moving south. Because the industries like the textile industry was moving south to get cheap labor. Um, and they were very successful. You're not going to be able to do that by reducing wage rates in Massachusetts. What you have to do is you have to support workers in the South who are organizing. You have to help them raise their rates so that, that you don't have competition based on wages. 
That's what we're going to have to basically be doing at a, at a global, uh, global level. We're also going to have to be engaged in global bargaining. Uh, you know, right now you have some unions that appeal to various multinationals for, um, uh, um, the, the term is escaping me, but these global framework agreements where a company promises that they will be good. Um, that's a nice idea morally. It doesn't work practically. What we need are, in fact, global bargaining standards so that the workers in Bangladesh are not subjected to the kinds of treatments that they're getting from multinational corporations. So, okay, uh, uh, there are a couple of factors here I think we need to wrestle with in the time we have together. I mean, and I want to get to this one huge piece because I think it is the piece that overshadows everything, which is race and racism in our world, which divides every movement that That's has right. ever existed in this country and stops us from ever moving ahead. Let's jump. All right. right. All right. So that is what has divided is the union movement in this country a lot besides the heritage from Samuel Gompers in the 1890s That's right. when he decided he didn't need a movement that was uh, built on uh, social or economic justice. You need a movement that could negotiate with the, the white power elite who, that owns the businesses for, the, for better wages. Mm -hmm. And that's been at the heart of the battle of uh, unions in our country, right? And the CIO lost its way when it became the AFL-CIO in some ways. Um, Actually, a few years before that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you would know you wrote the book. Okay. So, so the question becomes, though, without a movement, without something that puts teeth behind progressive politics, whether it's inside or outside the Democratic Party, without a trade union movement that really organizes and understands race, as right. we tried to do in the 60s and it fell apart. That's right. So I mean, so so I mean, that's what we're missing here. Yeah. In terms of building something, can actually respond to this and say it in a way that's understandable and digestible for most people who, who really do want to understand where we are. But I, I think that that's right, and I want to touch on that before we lose time. Yeah. But I want to say something else that you may not agree with and may irritate people. Go ahead, um, please. But, <laughs> um, the other thing that we have to accept is that there's a lot of evil people in this country. Um, there are, when you look at Trump's base, the core of his, tr of his base are people that I call zombies, right? They are evil and they've lost their humanity. Um, of the 35 to 40 percent of people that still have a favorable view of Trump, which part of them are zombies, I'm not quite sure. But when you look at regular uh, recurring uh, polling over different elections, you can see that there's a pretty s steady core of about 25 percent at least of the electorate that are thoroughly reactionary. These are people, Mark, that we're not winning. And, and, and we're not going to ever win them. It's just like in those zombie movies. Once you become a zombie, you don't return to humanity, right? There's no coming back. That's it. And, and so I start there because it's important for progressives to understand that there is a social base in this country for really nefarious activities. Um, that even if we do things 100% right, there are some very evil people in this country. It's not 1%. It's bigger than that. Um, there may be 1% dominating, but it's bigger than that, that are very, very evil. So let me ask you this question about this evil thing. For a moment. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a word that is almost biblical in its use. Yeah. Right? That's right. And... And, and that's often what some folks on the other side will throw here, right. that we are also evil. Right. So that's why words are important yeah. to me um, and how we use them. I mean, I would always posit that, that 25 to 35 or more, I'm not even sure the percentage, just looking at the polls and studies, of white folks in America are deeply racist. That's the 25% you're talking about, I think, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Th that change is difficult to come about. Changing their hearts and minds is difficult to come about. Though I've seen it happen with Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi, working with former Klansmen. I've seen it with the Young Patriots in Chicago, right. working with the Black Panthers and Young Lords in the 60s. I've seen it in our own work here as organizers in a neighborhood that was called South Baltimore, and when they didn't show fight, they decided to call it Federal Hill instead. 
um, which is just the park. But at any rate, the, 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 um, that when we organized the first interracial tenants union across these lines, it were really racist lines. So people can be brought together around common struggle. But, and you... <laughs> so what does this mean? Let's talk about this. It means, it means that, <laughs> that there are... That, that um, like an iceberg, there will be calving, right? There, there will be parts of the iceberg that will fall off. There will be people that will be won over, absolutely. But I'm saying that there is a social base that is rooted in the settler slavery origins of this country that is committed to our annihilation. This is not a hypothetical question. Our being black folks, our being... Not just black, but progressives. Period. Right. Right, right, right. Um, they, and many of them are armed, and I don't mean just with shotguns. And, and so they have a view of the world that is totally apocalyptic. They have a view of the world that is, uh, is, is very Hobbesian of a war of all against all. And while there are individuals that can be won over, we shouldn't spend our time with that, which is why I'm actually optimistic, because at least two-thirds of this country is sane. And we may not agree, but there is something to be said for sanity, right? And that way you can actually have debates um, and, and I'm convinced that we can win over most of this country. I'm not sure whether most of the white folks, but most of this country. And, and we have to do that on a basis of strength and on a basis of building a movement. And that goes to your point, that um, it's, it's not simply oppositional. It is really constructing a narrative and objectives that speak to the fundamental crisis that exists in the society, the economic, the social, the environmental. Um, that's the direction that we need to be going, and that necessitates organization, not just demonstrations and marches, right. not right. just tweeting, right, uh, and, and other kinds of commentary, but we have to be engaged in a fight for power. The Koch brothers, on the other side, they understand this. I was just reading this article about how they're going after mass transportation by doing grassroots organizing, whereas many of us think organizing is by posting something on Facebook. Right. No, no, we... Um, the left started the art and science of organizing. Absolutely. And we've given it over. Absolutely. We've forgotten how, what it means to be an organizer. Yeah. We think social, social media is organizing. Right. And it's not, not the hard work it took in interviewing all the old SNCC workers and being part of that movement. Right. It was the hard work people did day to day organizing farmers and others to, cha to build a movement that changed the nature of segregation and ended it Precisely. and started building a movement. So, so the question, but the other part of this is, um, I think the majority of white people probably will not come over, though I think there's a huge minority of white people who are part of this world more than absolutely. ever before in American history, yeah, yeah, which I, which yeah. I'm, that makes me optimistic to see that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, um, but the question is that at the core of the contradictions in this country is race and racism mm -hmm. because of how we were founded and who we are as that's a people. Right. It's a disease that's embedded in the psyche and consciousness of America. That's right. So you can't build a movement without addressing that. That's right. And addressing that is very, is, is very hard. Mm -hmm because of the reality of the depth of racism and how people don't want to hear about it. Right. Some people don't want to hear about right. it. So how about the, 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 the being at the core okay, so of what, what could build us and what could destroy us? So I think that if you look at... Um, I'm going to pick on the Sanders campaign. Yeah, I was going to come back to that. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I think that they grab defeat from the jaws of victory. And I get irritated when I hear all these complaints about how Hillary stole the nomination, everything. No, 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 no. Like Democrats blaming the Russians. Right. Well, right. Even, well, <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that's a whole yeah. other. We right. won't get there now. Right. Another, another okay. conversation. Because I do think the Russians were involved, but I that's a too. different that's thing. Right. But, um, but I think that the issue with Sanders, 
I'm convinced Sanders could have won the nomination. I'm absolutely convinced of it. But there were a few problems. One is that in the beginning, he didn't run to win. He didn't think, he did not anticipate, no matter what anyone said, did not anticipate the kind of response. But the other part of the problem was this, that he has a narrative that has been unchanging. And that narrative is a generic narrative about the economy. Had Sanders spent time traveling around this country, meeting with leaders of color, and listening to them, not just introducing himself, but listening to them, and talking with them about their struggles, their vision, and united their stories with his, I think he would have had a different narrative. The problem was that his narrative, when he was pressured, added on race, added on gender, but it didn't feel that it was integral. And when it doesn't feel it's integral, it leads many people, particularly people that have been around for a while, to become skeptical. We've heard this before. So, when we're talking about this, we're talking about integrating the issue of race into the larger narrative about what's happening to the economy, what's happening to the environment. Uh, we're talking about um, that you can look and see in the story that, it, for example, it would have been very helpful to have Sanders talk about Puerto Rico early on early on about looking at Puerto Rico and looking at what was happening as a result of neoliberalism to Puerto Rico, connecting that to the colonial question and saying, why are we not talking about Puerto Rico, right? It would have been incredible to have had him talking about the, 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 the change in the economy and how, in fact, we could have seen evidence of this as early as the late 1950s, early 1960s, that in fact, the 1963 March on Washington started under the auspices of A. Philip Randolph as a march for jobs that was talking about the right. economic crisis that was facing black and Puerto Rican workers. That if Sanders' narrative had started there, it would have been, it would have been a very different story. If, if, if Sanders was talking about what was happening to Native Americans and, and the issue of, of, of land loss, of economic development, we might have had a different campaign. If he had been talking about um, what was happening to Chicano workers, not, I'm talking about non-immigrants, right? Um, we might have had a different campaign. And so, so integrating the issue of race is not just throwing a bone at us. It's not having mm. a black or Latino or Asian uh, surrogate speaking on your behalf, but speaking your narrative. It is making sure that the story is one that people look at and say, yeah, I see myself in that. And it's a really important point you raise here as we wind down is, is because when Sanders was confronted by these young women activists, black activists who jumped on stage, it made him step back a moment. Right. But he didn't go deeper far enough That's right. with his response to it. Precisely. In terms of the inclusion you're talking about. It, did, it was like throwing bones, but I mean, and, and, it, it, and he, the, the sad thing is he had the analytical, intellectual capability of understanding what was going on at that moment. He did. He did. And for a reason, didn't take it. And he could have looked at the Jesse Jackson campaign of 1988 right. and seen in that examples. I, I tell you, I saw in Jay Maine during a strike, right? I went up there. There were no black people in the room. Jesse had spoken the week before. Oh, he's talking about in 88? In 88. Right, right, right. When I was announced as representing the Jackson campaign, the room went wild. These right? are white workers from Maine. White workers <laughs> who saw in Jackson right. their champion. Right? We needed African Americans, Latinos, Asians, Native Americans to look at Sanders and not simply say, yeah, I support that, but yes, this guy is our champion. 
No, exactly. Now, people don't realize this. This would be a whole, a whole different conversation we could have on Jesse Jackson and oh, what yeah. that campaign meant oh, yeah. in the 80s. We'll have to do that. Um, and also looking back and, to me, connecting the dots between that and the campaign that Robert F. Kennedy had and his relationship with King and what that could, might have met, meant in terms of... But also what you're saying, just to conclude here, is that what you're describing would have inspired, still inspired, all the white activists Absolutely. who supported Sanders. That's, that's part of why they yes. were there. Not exactly. understanding that this is the first time in American history where you see a, a large minority of younger white people especially who want to deal with race right. and racism mm -hmm. and address it. Mm -hmm. You know, and so, yeah, we're missing, there's a lot we're missing here. Yeah. Bill Fletcher Jr., of course, is a longtime union activist, uh, writer, intellectual, author, uh, who joins us here in studio, former president of Trans Africa Forum. Forum. Uh, and has joined us here on the Mark Steiner Show on the Real News Network. And Bill Fletcher, always great to see you. Thank you so much. That's a pleasure, Mark. Thanks so much. See you all next week.